I, I love uh, what you said, Carol. If, if we look for reasons to complain, there will be many. One thing we regularly talk about in our household, uh, just with four kids of various ages, uh, there can be a lot of things to point out and complain and critique. And one thing we often talk about in our family is, okay, what does it look like to look for solutions instead of reasons to complain? I think in the same way, when we look across the board at our community and we look at the raising of our children, again, whatever school path you choose for your children, private, public, home, whatever it is, none of it's perfect, and yet all of it can be fruitful ground for discipleship and witness. And what does it look like to pray in that regard that with what we have, we've seen that before in the Bible, right? Like Jesus can take one kid's lunch and feed everybody that's there. He can take our humble efforts and make it so much more as we turn our attention to the reality he's with us. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Yes, school has started already this week, even over in our children's ministry. It's promotion Sunday. Those that are like in grade levels have moved up to their next Sunday school class. But over here in the main service, we got a few more weeks left in our summer series through the Great Commission. And what we're going to be looking at this morning really focuses on what Jesus says to us about his presence with us. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 28. We'll be looking at verses 18 to 20 again. If you need a Bible, uh, the, the ushers would love to, to give you one to use during the service. I'll have a lot of the, the verses up on the screen as well. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love for this to be our gift to you um, that, that you can use and take with you. But in Matthew chapter 28... Verses 18 to 20, this is what we've been looking at, but this is week seven out of nine weeks that we're going to spend looking at this passage. Here's what Jesus says in this, these marching orders, this commissioning statement to his disciples of what he's calling them now to do as the culmination of how he had walked with them over a three plus year period of time. Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I didn't wrestle control. I didn't claim something that wasn't mine. My father has entrusted all authority to me and I've demonstrated my authority in the way that I bring life and blessing and healing to those around me. All authority is mine. I'm king of kings and lord of lords. Amen? Therefore, on the basis of the universal eternal authority of Jesus, he tells us as his followers, make disciples of all nations. And do this by going to all nations and by making disciples as you go. By baptizing those who believe in this name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And by last week we looked at this idea of teaching to keep, to observe and practice and pass on all that Jesus has commanded. And today we're going to look at the last phrase of what Jesus says at the end of verse 20. Behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. That's our focus this morning. And it's good that we focus on this phrase of Jesus because that word that he starts with, behold, that's what it means. Focus, pay attention, observe, pay careful attention, be, uh, notice what I'm saying here. It was fun, I did a little word study on that word behold uh, this week. I came across something in an exegetical dictionary of the New Testament that says this, that word edu in Greek or behold, it serves a number of functions when we see it in scripture, to, to awaken attention, either by us as readers or perhaps by the people that are hearing it said, behold, pay attention, clue in. If you've checked out, check back in. To introduce something new, to emphasize the importance of a subject, or as a summons to pay more careful attention or observation to something. And I guess what I would say is here in Matthew 18 or 28 verse 20, all of these things fit in what Jesus is saying. Behold, I'm with you always. Jesus is saying, pay attention. Pay attention to my presence with you. Not only that, he's saying, I'm introducing something new. Listen in, because there's something new about the way that I'm with you now as a result of what I've just accomplished. He's wanting to emphasize the importance of his presence with us in the mission that he's called us to accomplish. And for all of those reasons, it is well worth our time to give careful consideration to Jesus' words here. Amen? So as we walk through this idea from the Great Commission, what does it mean that Jesus is with us always to the end of the age? There's three main points I'm going to hit on today. First, we need Jesus with us. It's essential. We cannot accomplish the mission that he's given us without him. But not only is Jesus with us because we need him, 
He wants to be with us. We're going to trace that for a second and just see the relentless desire of God throughout his story to be with his people and to overcome the obstacles that create separation between us and him. Jesus wants to be with us. And then the third thing we're going to look at is this idea of, well, how how is Jesus? How is Jesus with us always to the end of the age? That's where we're going to look. But the thing, again, that I want to start with is this idea that we need Jesus with us. We cannot accomplish the mission that he's given us of making disciples of all nations without him. And I'm not just talking about Cornerstone. as one local church that seeks to engage in this mission. Even if you take what we call the universal church, made up of all believers in all places throughout all of time, even that collective group of people that cannot be numbered, we're still not up to the task. We're still not sufficient for the calling that Jesus has given us. But as Jesus himself said earlier in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 19, what's impossible for man is possible for God. It's possible for him. You see, what what Jesus says here in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission, in many ways it follows a pattern that we see pop up several times throughout the biblical story. There are many commissioning statements in Scripture where God calls an individual or a group of people to some mission, some task to accomplish, which in all reality is too big, too difficult for them to accomplish on their own. And what we see in this pattern is that regularly the people are well aware of it. They'll say, who am I? That I how, how do you expect me to be able to do that? And God immediately follows up with this promise, I will be with you. In other words, it's, it's not really about you and what you think you can or cannot do. If I'm with you, you have what you need to do what I've called you to do. Does that make sense? So what I want to do is take a few minutes to kind of trace that pattern. The first time that we see this pattern of, of God, God calling people to something, them going, I can't do it, and he says, it's okay because I'm with you. It's not only possible, the success in this venture is guaranteed because I'm with you. The first time that we see this pattern occur is in Exodus chapter 3 with Moses at the burning bush. You may be familiar with this story. I, miss, I skipped that one. You may be familiar with this story of Moses. He's shepherding sheep out in the middle of the wilderness, and he sees this bush that is burning. It's on fire, but it's not consumed. And he says, hmm, behold, pay attention to. What is this thing? I need to go see what this thing is. So he draws near to this bush, and the Lord calls to him out of the bush. He says, take off your sandals, because the ground that you're on is holy. And Moses realized, oh my gosh, I'm before the God of gods, the king of kings, right? And the Lord begins to speak to him. He says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them into the land that I promised them, the land, this good, broad land flowing with milk and honey. God says, I know the problem that's going on, the way that Pharaoh is mistreating my people, and I'm here to rescue them. Awesome, cool, God, no problem for you, right? But look at what happens in the very next part. He says, I've heard the cry of my people. And then in verse 10, he says to Moses, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Okay, how is God gonna bring the people out of Israel or of Israel out of Egypt? Moses, you're gonna go do it. And how does Moses respond? Who am I (laughs) that I should do this, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And again, God almost like skips right past the question that Moses asked. It's not about who, who you are. I will be with you. I will be with you. And this will be the sign for you. You know what? The next time that you're at this mountain, you're gonna have all the people of Israel with you right here at this mountain. You're gonna go, ah, just like you said, Lord. You were faithful to what you promised would happen. Now, again, we we know in this circumstance that there's a lot more questions that that Moses has, a lot more doubts, and God is so patient in this dialogue there at the burning bush to, to walk with Moses through his doubts and his questions until finally Moses is out of doubts, he's out of questions, and finally he just um, says, I don't want to do it. <laughs> in Exodus chapter 4, he says, oh my Lord, please just send someone else. Like, this doesn't really fit in with my plans. Please just send someone else. And it's at this point that it says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. I've called you to do this. 
I've addressed your concerns. And now this isn't just a matter of timidity or doubt. This is willful disobedience. This is you wanting to reject the thing that I've called you to do. And yet for the way that the anger of the Lord is kindled, look at how patiently he still walks with Moses. He says, your brother Aaron, I know he can speak well. I'll send him with you. He'll go with you. But but it's not, okay, cool. You don't want to do it? That's fine. I'll take Aaron instead. We'll have a sub. We'll sub you out and he'll do the job instead. He doesn't let Moses off the hook. He says, you're still going to go and you're still going to do this. He calls Moses to still be faithful. But I love what he says there in verse 15. Again, this, the, the repetition of this promise. He says, I will be with your mouth. If you're concerned that you don't know what to say, I will be with your mouth and with Aaron's mouth and I will teach you both what to say. I'll be with you. I'll teach you. You won't just observe. It's not just show up and I'll take care of the rest. He says, I'll teach you. You'll watch what I do. You'll do with me. I'll empower you. I'm calling you to discipleship, if you will. Now, were Moses and Aaron successful at the mission that God had sent them on? Did they lead the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt? Yes. Was it because Moses and Aaron were such gifted leaders, persuasive speakers? No, it's because God was with them. Because the Lord was with them on the mission that he sent them on, It was not only possible, their success was guaranteed. The next place we see this this pattern pop up is with with Joshua, Moses' successor, the one who, who took over the lead of the people of Israel after Moses had died. When it was time now to lead the people into the promised land that God had sent them into. The problem was there was a lot of people that already lived in the promised land. God said that the Israelites would be his chosen instrument of judgment to, to bring his punishment on the descendants, on the people of the, of the land. But the people of the land lived in big, strong, fortified cities, and some of them were literally giants, like they towered over the people of Israel. Remember in the, in the book of Numbers, it says that the 12 spies went to spy out the land, and they came back and said, it's a good land, but the people there are like giants. We're like grasshoppers compared to them. Joshua was one of those spies. He, at the time, had said, we can do it because the Lord's with us. And now it's like, okay, Joshua, it's your turn. You're up. Here's what the Lord says to him. He says, okay, Moses, my servant's dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan and you and all this people into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Why? Because just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. And look what happens next. Three times right after that, he says, be strong and courageous. Only be strong and courageous. Be faithful to the law. Pay attention to what I've commanded Moses to do. But again, in verse 9, he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or discouraged. Why? Because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Was Joshua successful in the mission that God gave him to bring the Israelites into the promised land? Yes. Because Joshua was such a strong and charismatic leader? No, I I imagine in many ways that Joshua was probably a pretty timid, reluctant leader. I mean, I think that's probably why God three times has to not just tell him to be courageous, but command him to be courageous. A headstrong, cocky, self-confident leader does not need to be told to be strong and courageous. They already think that they are, right? But I think Joshua saw the enormity of the task that God has called him to, and he was daunted by it. Yet God says, not just says, but commands, be strong and courageous. There is no reason for you to shrink back if you know who I am, and I'm with you. I'm with you. There's another place where we see this pattern. We won't have time to look at it this morning, but in the book of Judges, chapter 6, something very similar to the conversation between Moses and the Lord at the burning bush happens with a guy named Gideon. The Israelites are being oppressed by a group of people called the Midianites, and God calls this one dude, Gideon, go lead them in battle and victory against the Midianites. How am I supposed to do this? What do you think God says? I'll be with you. That's how. I'll be with you. God leads Gideon and his men in this this remarkable, even a miraculous victory. And to make sure that Gideon and the guys knew that it wasn't because of their own strength or skill, 
He says, I'm only going to give you 300 men to take into battle against an army that you can't even count. That he says, it's like the sand on the seashore. Was Gideon successful even despite those odds? Yes, because the Lord was with him. Unfortunately, in the story of Gideon, we see that even on the day of battle, as he's encountering this victory, we see it start to go to Gideon's head. He starts, the success, the success goes to his head. He starts to throw his weight around, pretend like he's this big leader that he can kick butt and take names, and really Gideon doesn't end up super well. But the point even there is this. God gave Gideon victory in the task that he gave him, not just because of Gideon's strength or valor, or even humility. Success came because God was with him. The God who called Gideon to the mission promised to be with him, and because God was with him, there was success. You getting the point? Jeremiah. Many years later in the the history of Israel, there's there's a prophet named Jeremiah who in a very similar way in Jeremiah chapter one, God calls him and says, you're gonna be a prophet to the nations. He says in particular, what you're going to do is you're gonna be a voice of judgment. You're going to speak to the people of Israel about the way that they've turned away from me and rejected me. You're going to call them back to me to repent and turn, but they're not going to listen. You're going to tell them that they're going to be destroyed. You will actually see them be destroyed, and you will faithfully tell the people what I tell you to say, even though they will attack and persecute you because of it. Sound like a fun job? Who'd want to sign up for that one? This is why we often call Jeremiah the weeping prophet. God gave him a hard job. And yet the remarkable thing about Jeremiah, he's also one of the greatest examples of faithfulness in the midst of suffering. Why was he able to be faithful to the Lord even in the midst of the hardship that he endured? Look what he says. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, Jeremiah. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. But then, like we've seen before, Jeremiah goes, how can I do this? Oh, Lord, behold, behold, pay attention. Lord, maybe you haven't noticed this, but I'm young. I don't know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. But the Lord says, ah, nothing slips my focus. I didn't miss the fact that you're young. Do not say I am only a youth. For to all whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. Why? For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. He says to him a little bit later, dress yourself for work. Arise, say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed before the people, otherwise I will dismay you before them. I'm calling you to be faithful to me, and there's consequences if you're not. And I behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the whole land, against its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. Why? I'm with you. I'm with you to deliver you. How did Jeremiah succeed in the difficult, painful mission that God gave him? Because God was with him. Okay, so take all of that, this pattern that we've seen with Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Jeremiah, and bring all of that with you into the Great Commission. The mission that Jesus has given us as his followers is different from what he gave to Moses or Gideon or Joshua. It's not to lead one nation in some sort of military victory or deliverance over another nation. The mission that Jesus has called us to do encompasses all nations. Not through force exerting our will and military might, but through discipleship. Teach them. Help them to learn from me, become like me, trust me, help others to do the same. Disciple the nations by going and baptizing and teaching them. Again, think about the pattern with Moses and the guys. When you read those words, are we supposed to feel capable of that mission on our own? No. We're meant to feel overwhelmed. Who are we? that we should be able to do this, Lord. And just like he did with Moses, with Gideon, with Jeremiah, 
I will be with you always to the end of the age. Because Jesus is with us, success in our mission of worldwide discipleship is not only possible, it is guaranteed. Do you see that? But it's not just that Jesus is with us because we need him. He knows we need him. But the thing that we see clearly in scripture is that Jesus wants to be with us. He wants to be with us. This is something that I've preached on several times before. We've done whole series where we've walked through this idea of God's relentless desire to be with his people. Uh, a few summers ago, I, I did a, a summer series just even talking about this idea, what does it mean that we're made in the image of God and how even that idea is connected with God's desire to share his presence with us and mediate his presence through us to the world. Two different times during the Christmas season, we've done Advent series where we've walked through this story of Emmanuel, God with us. Remember, that's one of the names that, that's given prophetically to Jesus in Isaiah 7. Emmanuel, God with us. And we've shown how this idea of God with us doesn't just start with Jesus. It goes throughout the entirety of Scripture. Again, those, those series are still in our sermon archive online, so I won't re-preach all of that today, but I do think that it's important to stop for a second and at least just skip the rock across the top so we see not just how God dwells with us, but his relentless desire to be with us. Not because we deserve it, but because it's what he wants. And our God gets what he wants. Amen? In the beginning, we read of God walking with God, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day. It's this really beautiful picture of just intimate, close-up fellowship, the sharing of life together in a beautiful world, a beautiful garden that God created as the place where he would dwell with his people. But yet in that same chapter of Genesis 3 is when we read of Adam and Eve rebelling against God turning away from him, saying we want to take the lives, the bodies, the minds, the world that you've given us and do our own thing with it to our own destruction. We see in Genesis 3 how God then banishes and drives the man and woman from that garden, from that special home that he created for them to be with him. And it's tragic, but praise God, it's not the end of the story, right? Right? From the moment that they rebel against him, God was already unleashing a plan of redemption, a way to bring us back to him. Again, not because we deserve it, we clearly don't, but because it's what he made us for. We looked earlier at how God called Moses to bring the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, and we saw how, God was, how Moses was successful in that mission because God was with him. In the book of Exodus, later on, we read of how God brought the people to the foot of Mount Sinai, that same mountain where he appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And he said, here's why I did this. I bore you on eagle's wings. I brought you to myself so that you might be my people and I would be your God. You're living in tents in the middle of the wilderness, so here's what I want you to do. Make a really big tent for me and put it right smack in the middle of the camp because I want to be with you. Yet the reality is, with that tabernacle, that tent that God made, there was, there was the need for separation and distance and boundaries. He made it very clear to them how close or how far they needed to stay from where his presence was, was focused within that tabernacle, lest he break out against them. You see, while God absolutely, relentlessly desires to be with his people, the reality of our sin, the reality of our brokenness, our defilement, means that we are not fit to be in God's presence in the way that he intended. There's a way in which he creates this distance, this separated presence for our own protection. Because there are real obstacles. Our sin, our rebellion creates real obstacles and separation in our relationship with God. But those obstacles, praise God, would ultimately be overcome through Jesus Christ. The amazing thing about Jesus Christ, we see an even greater way in which God dwells with his people. Not in a tabernacle or a tent or even a temple, a big grand building, but in a person. That is the glory that though we have a table set up already, we're looking forward to celebrate in December. 
that God took on flesh, that Jesus is God who became flesh, human, just like we are, to draw closer to us than ever before since the Garden of Eden. That Jesus is God who came to be with us, to call us back into relationship with him. He's a God who does not not stand off from our brokenness. He draws near to the sick and the sinful with healing and with forgiveness. It's beautiful. He called people, come, be with me, follow me, learn from me. Come learn how to do life with me. But in some ways, one of, the, one of the puzzles when we look at the life of Jesus is just this question of how can he be so close? How can Jesus come so close to us when previously he told the people of Israel to stay back at a safe distance for their own safety? The reality is that Jesus came not just to be with us, but to overcome the obstacles that made it hard for us to be with him, that made it impossible for us to be with him. That's what his death and resurrection are all about. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus gained victory over those things that separated us from him. Our own sinfulness, death, Satan himself. He gained victory over those things in order to bring us back to himself. I love the way that Peter puts this in 1 Peter chapter 3 when he says this. For Christ, Jesus, he also suffered once for sins. He was righteous and we are unrighteous and yet he took our place. The righteous for the unrighteous. Why? So that he might bring us to God. Fulfill his own desire to be near to us, to bring us near to him. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So take all of that again now and bring that with us back into this great commission. When Jesus says, behold, pay attention, focus in, I'm telling you something new. Can you almost hear the excitement, the anticipation in Jesus' voice? I'm with you always because of what I have just accomplished. I know you don't fully understand this yet. I know that even coming to this mountain, you're worshiping me and you're doubting at the same time. We'll talk about more about that next week. I know you don't fully can't wrap your minds around this, but understand this, because of what I've done, because of the victory that I've won over the things that stood between us through my death and resurrection, we now get to be together in an even greater way than you've experienced with me walking from town to town with you thus far. Behold, there's something new and important. I'm with you. But if you're familiar with this, Where this event falls in the life of Jesus, you may also have another question in your mind, which is this. Okay, so Jesus says here in Matthew 8, 28, verse 20, I am with you always. But isn't it just a matter of days before he leaves? He says he's with us always, but then he ascends back into heaven to the right hand of the Father. And is that not where Jesus is right now? Yes, it is. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father with all enemies being placed under his feet. He ascended with the promise that one day he would come back again, but the reality is that parousia, that royal coming of Jesus that we learned about earlier this year from 1 and 2 Thessalonians, it has not yet arrived. So this is that third point. How is it that Jesus is with us always if he left and he hasn't come back yet? How is Jesus with us? Well, this is where we need to look at that other great commission passage that we've come to several times throughout this series. In Acts chapter 1. Take that look at that. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. What does Jesus say? Again, immediately before he ascends back into heaven in Acts 1. You will receive power when what happens? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So how is it that Jesus is both with us always and in heaven? Because the risen Lord Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God himself, to be with all who trust and follow him. That's how Jesus is with us. This is why the doctrine of the Trinity is so central to the Christian faith. 
The idea that God is three in one. The way that we put it in our doctrinal statement, you can find on the website, is this. That there is one God eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are co-eternal in being, co-identical in nature, co-equal in power and glory. There's so much more that we can go into that. It is a mysterious, grand truth that we're not just meant to go step back and go, I don't know, maybe it's like an egg or like water or something like that, or maybe we'll just figure it out one day. No, the, the, the indivisible relationship, the loving fellowship of the Trinity is the very fabric of reality, the source of all that exists. We are meant to, Chris Hay preached about this uh, last year before he retired, this idea of to join in the dance of the Trinity, to join in this interplay of the love and the honor and the life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus in the Great Commission when he talks about how those who believe are to be baptized, he says to baptize them in the one name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are baptized. Is this, this symbol of now being united with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through what Jesus has accomplished. Understand this. This is why Jesus is such a big deal. And what he has accomplished is such a big deal. The Father who is God sent the Son, Jesus, who is God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, who is God. So that through his life, he would testify and announce the goodness and demonstrate the goodness of God's kingdom to us and then accomplish our rescue through his death and resurrection. And then having done that, having risen again, Jesus, the Son, who is God, ascended back to the right hand of the Father, who is God, and sent the Spirit, who is God, to dwell in and empower all those who trust in Jesus. And because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, triune, even though Jesus is in heaven, he is also with us always to the end of the age. Why? Because the Spirit who is one with him and the Father is with us. I love the way that Paul puts this in Ephesians chapter two when he says that through Jesus, we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. Three in one. This is good news. Such good news that Jesus himself in John 16 told his disciples, it's to your advantage. It's better for you if I leave so that I will send this spirit. How can that be? How can it be better for Jesus to leave? Well, think about it this way. Jesus is God and man united in a singular human being. But we see throughout his ministry that God dwelling with us in Jesus as one man is limited like we are to one place and one time. But the spirit, God dwelling not just in one man, but in all who trust and follow Jesus is with us always in all places at the same time. How amazing is that? This is even better than the tabernacle. This is even better than Jesus himself. The spirit dwells in us in order to empower us to fulfill the mission that Jesus has given us. I'm gonna come back in just a second to talk more about how he empowered. What does he do in us to enable us to accomplish our mission? But before we do that, I wanna point us forward to what is yet to come because even as amazing as it is that the spirit has been given to us to be God with us, there's an even greater Emmanuel coming. There's an even greater, the fulfillment, the grand conclusion of the story of God's desire to be with his people. We find in Revelation 21, as John receives this vision and then tries in some way to put it in words that can help us capture something of the picture of the grandeur of what he sees. Look what he says in Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. <laughs> Whoa, okay. And then I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the place where God's presence would dwell in the midst of his people. There's a, a God and man togetherness, even in just this idea of Jerusalem. He says, I saw this new city coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, pay attention, focus. This is important. I'm telling you something new. Behold, behold. The dwelling place of God is with 
man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. It gets better. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. Why? Because the former things will have passed away. And then he who was seated on the throne, our God, says, Behold, pay attention, I am making all things new. What a day that will be, church. It's coming. It's not here yet. This is coming at the end of the age. But until then, through the Spirit, Jesus, as he says in the Great Commission, is with us until the end of the age. And he is with us so that we might devote ourselves to the mission that he's given us, to make disciples of all nations. That's why we're here. To proclaim the gospel of Jesus as king to all nations, as a testimony to them. And then, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, the end will come. The church will be successful in our mission to, to disciple all nations. I don't know if that means necessarily, like maybe perhaps some of you who hold more of a post-millennial understanding of last things, that that, that that means that there will be a pervasive Christianization of all nations. But I think what we see like in Revelation 7, we see this multitude of people from all nations. Disciples will be made from amongst every people group. We will be faithful to the mission. We will fulfill the mission that Jesus has given us. Why? Because we're so great. Because God is with us always till the end of the age. Let me wrap up with this. The Spirit of God is with us to empower us for mission, I would say, in three ways. I won't go into detail on this. If you're someone who likes to pull out your phone and take a picture of slides, do this one. Come back to this one as something to read and study later. As we look at the New Testament, what is it the Spirit does? He's with us. That's awesome. Because God's with us, our mission can be accomplished. It will be accomplished because God himself has committed himself to it. But what is it that the Spirit does in us to empower us to fulfill this mission? I would say it kind of boils down to these three things. Number one, if being a disciple is about becoming like our teacher, the Spirit is the one who transforms us into the image of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3 talks about that. Not all at once. But from one degree of glory to another, we are transformed to be like our king. That's good news, amen? Second thing that we see very clearly, the spirit is in us. He's been given to us to unite us together as God's people. That's very clear in the New Testament, particularly in Ephesians and in, in 1 Corinthians. As a matter of fact, a lot of the verses that Christians like to argue about, about spiritual gifts and how they're supposed to work or not work in the church, the one thing that's super clear in those passages is that the reason why the Spirit gifts believers in different ways for different things is to unite us, to, to, to weave us together and build us up, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ as the body of Christ, the people of God, build one another up in love. How does the Spirit equip us and empower us for our mission? He makes us like Jesus, and he makes us one with one another. And then as we saw clearly from Acts 1, the Spirit is here to empower us to witness, to speak in clear ways who Jesus is and what he's done. And not just speak in clear ways, but then to demonstrate through our lives the reality that yes, Jesus is king. Yes, his rule is good. Yes, sin can be put to death and we can grow in righteousness. Yes, even deep hurt that we've done to one another can be reconciled and mended and made new. And otherwise, what this means is that all three of these things go together. Our witness to the nations must be coupled with this idea of transformation and unity in our lives together. It's what actually lends credibility to the message that we speak, not just talking about Jesus, but demonstrating the goodness of his rule through our lives. Even when we witness or evangelize or tell others good news about Jesus, we do so as disciples, those who are learning from Jesus and trusting him and becoming like him so that we might help others do the same. 
And the way that we continue to grow as disciples is what, again, lends credibility to the demonstration, the, the, the way that we share this message. So all of this comes together in what we at Cornerstone for the last 25 plus years have put out as our mission statement. Why do we exist as a church? We exist because we believe that God has called us to give every individual an accurate picture of God by helping those who believe become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Do you see the logic in this statement? How is it that we as one local church family will give those around us an accurate, a clear picture of who God is? It's as we, as followers of Jesus, learn to be fully devoted to him. The transformation, the unity of our lives is what then begins, gives a clear proclamation to those around us. So let me say this to you. If you're with us this morning and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, this is our hope. Is that as you interact with us, as you see what we say, as you watch the way we operate together, that more and more you would gain a clear picture of who our God is. We would love to help you understand who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. We won't do it perfectly. Our words and our actions sometimes won't match up. But we hope that even in our failings, we put the grace of our God on display and show the way that he forgives and restores us. And even through our failure, transforms us to be more like Jesus. I want to invite you to join us in this journey. If you, if you would like to talk with someone about what it means to follow Jesus or just pray with someone, there'll be a few of us up over here by the prayer room that would love to talk with you after service. Um, I'm going to invite Billy and, the, and the, the band to come back up here. We're going to sing one more song, and then kind of like we talked about last week, Todd and Pat and Linda McCoy will come up and talk a little bit more about uh, Pat's retirement. But before we move on, I want to say this to those of you who are believers. Would you stand with me if you are able? And you can stay standing as we sing this song. As we've made a practice throughout this series, I want to speak the words of this commission over you, over us as a church family. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. Therefore, let us go and make disciples of all nations and make disciples as we go, <laughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our God who is three in one, and teaching them to keep, to observe, and practice, and pass on all that Jesus has commanded us. And behold, pay attention because it's important. Jesus is with us always to the end of the age. And because he is with us, success in our mission is not only possible, but guaranteed. Amen? Amen. In that regard, let us sing to our King and ask him to build our lives and make us faithful, available, and teachable for this mission that he's given us. Love you guys. Thank you so much.